Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I see like David Bremer, Gino is here, Cameron's here. Cool. Oh, there's a bunch of people. Excellent. All right. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Scott from Dan's Camera City. Uh, we're going to allow a few minutes for people to join us and get situated and all that stuff. Uh, as people are filing in, I see some familiar names in here. There's a little raise hand at the bottom button at the bottom of Zoom. How many people uh, are familiar with Dan's or have taken a class here at Dan's or, uh, oh, oh, look at all the hands. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Oh yeah, I see a bunch of familiar people. Wonderful. It's, it's nice to have our little community here with us today. How many people have never heard of Dan's Camera City before and saw this cool looking macro seminar and decided to join us today? Let's see, somebody new to Dan's, a whole bunch of, oh, a lot of newcomers. Oh, excellent. Wonderful. Oh, nice. Well, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Wellington, New Zealand, you might be the winner. <laughs> good, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> Treasure Island, Florida, that sounds nice. Richmond, Virginia. Hi from England, Jennifer says, nice. Cool. It's always cool to see all these people here from all over the place. Oh, that's awesome. Wonderful. Well, if you're not super familiar with Dan's Camera City, we are the largest single location camera store in the state of Pennsylvania, over here in the United States. Um, my name is Scott. I'm the main photo instructor here at Dance Camera City. We run all kinds of classes and workshops and outings throughout the year. And we do these little online webinars. And it's great to get to see people from well outside our usual area, which is really cool. And in addition to this neat stuff that we do, we're, of course, a full service camera store. We've got cameras and lenses, including the very, really cool and unique stuff that Lawa does. Um, and a full staff of people who absolutely love photography and are here to answer any question that you've got. So even if you're not in our normal area, please feel free to get in touch with us. We're always happy to chat with new people and help you out with whatever questions may be bothering you. We can help you out no matter where you're located. We even do these little free video consultations if you want to like get online with us and chat and like look at the particular function of something. Uh, and then we have a full service lab where we print all kinds of cool stuff, everything from your standard little four by six prints up to 40 by 60 canvas prints and all kinds of other cool things that we can do with your pictures. Uh, we've got a full frame shop with some fantastic custom framing specialists. Um, we're just here to do all kinds of everything photography related, really. And Today's photography stuff is all about macro photography with Lawa. Uh, we've gotten to know these guys over the past few years, a fairly new lens manufacturer. I think you guys have been around since what, 2013, I think? Something like about that? Eight, about eight years, so yeah. that's, that sounds right. So, uh, and in that time, they've given us all this really cool, unique stuff that we haven't seen from any other manufacturer. So when they... Uh, they agreed to run this webinar with us today. We were pretty excited. This is our first session that we've done with Lawa and it will certainly not be our last. I've gotten a couple of questions about, will this session be recorded for future viewing? Yeah, I'm recording the session. And after this webinar, I will send out a follow-up email to everybody with a link to watch the recording and also some specials that are, I believe, exclusive to Dan's Camera City right now on Lawa lenses. Um, so, there's gonna be some special pricing available with us for you guys for attending us this webinar with us today. I'll make sure you get that information as well. Before we get started, I want you to go down into Zoom and hit the little um, buttons down at the bottom. There's one that says Q&A. And if you hit that, it will bring up the question and answer box. It looks like two little cartoon speech bubbles. If you've got questions about any of the stuff that we're going through as we're going through this webinar, throw them in the Q&A box and we will leave like 10 minutes or so at the end to go through your questions, get them answered and chat about anything that uh, kind of strikes your interest as we're going through the presentation. All right. So without every further ado, I'd like to welcome our two people from Lawa here today, Mr. Stephen Nepp, our Lawa representative, who will be with us on Saturday 
this coming Saturday at Dan's Camera City for a bunch of hands-on stuff. We're going to be doing an event on Saturday out in what we call our photo park, our big backyard where we've got all kinds of plants and stuff to take pictures of. And if you stop by for that, we'll have all these lenses out there for you to try out. And also with us today, Cheryl Belsack. And uh, she's going to be showing off. If you saw any of the really cool photographs in the, the banners and the promotions for this event, that's her stuff. And it's just really striking images. So I'm looking forward to this presentation a whole lot. So uh, yeah, take it away. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to start here and uh, say uh, thank you very much to Dan's. I have had this class conceptually in my head for quite a while now. Uh, the idea of being able to do a hybrid class where we've got a virtual educational component, and then we're going to get to do that hands-on. So Scott was asking if you could raise your hand if uh, if you're no Dan's, if you're new to Dan's. Uh, I want to know if you're planning on coming out on Saturday. If you could throw that uh, raise hands, uh, we're going to see a bunch of different Lao lenses. I've got equipment from other manufacturers as well, Godox, Nisi, um, the tools that I sort of use and have found really valuable. Um, in my macro photography. So um, I, yeah, and, and also certainly be able to work with Dan's and their, the amazing uh, the, the photo park that they have next door. Um, I'm excited to get out into that space and it works right along with the idea of we're gonna have a good virtual class here and learn a little bit more about macro and specifically things that we're thinking about as we're shooting flowers. Um, and then be able to get a hands-on and sort of play with some of the equipment and uh, answer some more questions uh, if you're able to actually come out. So um, I am not a flower photographer. And so as I was conceptualizing the, the, the pro work and uh, known Cheryl for a while, but uh, I think there was a, she did a class last year that I sat in on um, that just it came, became very clear uh, that that's who I wanted to work with on this, this program. And so um, she's gonna bring us some really, really amazing images and a lot of different experiences that, um, of the way that she shoots and what she's looking for. She's got a broad, big, big catalog of work that we're gonna get to see through uh, her eyes a little bit. So I'm gonna get started with the presentation here. And I'm going to duck out and mute myself so I don't accidentally make noise during your presentation. <laughs> All right. Um, so me, uh, I'm Stephen Neff. Uh, I am uh, the national sales manager for Venus Optics. I first started working in a camera store 20 years ago this year. Um, and I, from that point, I've sort of fallen in love with the idea of helping people take better pictures and helping people figure out how to use their equipment a little bit better. And so for, for the past 20 years, I've been able to figure out a way to, to really do that. And um, yeah, work with a couple of different manufacturers to, to help get equipment in the hands of more people and uh, help better understand it. So um, this was, this is me last week. Uh, I did an event in, uh, in New Jersey and I wanted to have some flowers for some hands-on macro stuff and using Cheryl's advice. And, and uh, as I was thinking about um, the things that I was thinking about for what I'm looking for, for a flower that I want to shoot is I was looking for some good detail. And I also wanted to be able to shoot some backlighting. So I wanted a, a good thin, um, pedal that I could shoot from behind and, and get some fun lighting on. So I went with an orchid. Um, it was also Mother's Day, so I was able to give it to uh, the store owner to give to his wife. So I won points there too. So um, Cheryl, we're going to see some more of her work and um, ranging from uh, still life, static, beautiful stuff, getting into some more conceptual um, and, and combining images and, and building some stuff out. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll let Cheryl give a little bit more of an introduction on, on her background and, and how she's, her path through photography and, and gotten to the point of uh, her macro work. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to, yeah, Cheryl, I'll let you jump in right there. 
Hi, I'm uh, Cheryl Balzac, and I, I'm a close-up and macro photographer. Um, I've worked as um, a product photographer, so, which gives me a very precise technical background um, in photography, but then I like to play as well and experiment. So um, I try and bring those two different um, ideas to my work. I, I have worked as a graphic designer as well, previous to picking up a camera. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a head cold, so I have my tea, <laughs> so I, get, I don't lose my voice. It's not good that this is starting already, but <laughs> um, where, where is it? Oh, so I started um, on, I'm sorry, we just lost Steven <laughs> and the photos. Um, maybe he'll be back. Steven, did you have, uh, we lost your screen share, I think. And you're muted, so I can't hear you. <laughs> Uh, sorry. I, yeah, I, my connection died for a second oh, there. Would you like me to do the screen share? I can do that. Yeah, if you want to take that over there. Okay, let's see. I'm going to try and switch my network over for a little more secure. All right. Shall you want to fire up the screen share then? You got I it? I will do that. Yep. Okay. It's a good We've thing got a thunderstorm going early, on so I was can... worried that it was going to be me that had the connection <laughs> problems. There we go. Perfect. All right. Well, we're back. <laughs> okay. So I started with software before I start, picked up a camera. So you can kind of see some of that in my work too. Um, so when we would we'll dig about dig into knowing your subject, and this is just so we have some um, mutual um, communication points. Um, I tend to not use the technical terms, but it's always good to see them, know them. Um, I might say more of the spiky things in the middle, <laughs> so <laughs> you'll know what I'm talking about there too. But um, when you're looking for a photos or a flower subject, I think it helps to know if you're looking for something specific or if you have something to know what it is, if you want to photograph it again, or if there's something specific you're looking for, um, when does it bloom? So, you know, if you're looking for daffodils, you're probably a little bit late right now. I have some late bloomers that are still out in my garden, but for the most part, those are gone. We're starting the tulips now. If you're looking for dahlias, you might still be too early, but you know, those are things that help if you're looking for something specific. Um, and where can you find it? You know, if I'm looking, I'm in Buffalo, New York area. If I'm looking for tropical flowers, you know, it's, it's going to be a difficult thing to find unless I go to the botanical gardens. And, um, and as you're um, looking at flowers and you find common names, um, sometimes they can be um, misleading. <laughs> so this is um, a spring ephemeral uh, flower. It's a bleeding heart. It's nice if you find them because they they usually grow in the shade. So even if it's bright sunshine outside, you can still get a nice pocket of soft light, which is usually what I, I tend to go for with flowers as a, a soft light. So this is a bleeding heart. It's like I said, it's a spring ephemeral. So if you look around June, July for it, the whole plant might be gone. You won't even know anything is planted there. I have one in my yard. So um, so looking for them now is a thing if you're looking for these. I was looking for one for years at my old house. And like one year I found it just down the street. <laughs> Had no idea it was there because I was looking at the wrong time of year. And this is a bleeding heart vine, which looks very different and it's tropical. So I can only find this one um, locally in my botanical gardens. And again, uh, common names, people call these both moonflowers. Um, they look quite similar, but if you look closely at the flowers themselves, you can see differences um, specifically in the points on the one on the left, but it's, it's a much bushier overall plant. And 
I'll show you the com or the more the scientific name, the detura, and it's actually a very poisonous plant. Um, and I took this photo just before a, a, one of my relatives uh, bought a house. It was like over the air conditioner, <laughs> and I was just gonna cut it back. But then I looked underneath, and all the seedlings. I, cut the whole thing back. I haven't been back there this spring yet and I'm guessing it's all back. <laughs> the one on the um, right is a relative of the morning glory. Um, so in it, this is the one that I believe is more technically called the moonflower. Um, technically correct, it's on a vine. It grows, um, so it, it climbs and um, it only blooms at night. So it'll open up around four or five o'clock. So it's just some interesting things. And we're not gonna get too much into this moving forward, but I just thought it was some interesting points. Um, so when you're selecting your flowers for photography, you wanna look closely at your condition, which clearly I did not hear. <laughs> I found this in kind of early October and I was very excited. Um, I had been at a children's museum with my kids and to see this and flowers are my thing. I took a photo and when I got home, I realized the condition was not good. I played with it to see what I could do. And obviously I was able to recover it in a, in a way that I would present, but um, there's work involved. <laughs> there's a lot of cloning. So you can do yourself a favor by not, by looking more closely at the condition before you take your photo or before you select your subject. And then again, um, this particular one, um, my kids, they picked a, bun a bunch of these from the backyard for me. And this one wasn't quite in the water. So when I saw what it did, the shape, I really wanted to photograph it. I saw it as graceful, but you can see the damage on it doesn't really tell that story. I was able to, I used the mixer brush on the petals to kind of add some flow to them, um, stood it up a little bit more straight. Um, and it does have, what I think is more graceful look to it. But again, um, that has to be intentional. And I think when you go for something that is fading, <laughs> um, everything else has to be really spot on um, to make it look intentional. So consider shooting your phases. Um, these, I'm gonna show you a bunch of buds. This one um, is the daffodil. And at this point it's kind of parallel to the ground. So it collect those water droplets from the rain, which I thought was really pretty. Um, this is a poppy just about to burst. So you can see the colors that'll come. Um, and that was in the summer. This uh, was just before our first frost um, in fall. So tiny little really deeply serrated bright green leaves, I thought contrasted really well with that red tiny bud. And um, our first frost actually came the next day, so it probably never opened. Um, and I'm into gardening, um, which probably goes without, <laughs> without mentioning since I am so into uh, the floral photography, it's great to have subjects nearby. And I've been told that you have to kill a lot of plants to get a green thumb. <laughs> so I'm working hard on that. <laughs> this is a spring blooming anemone. And I would take a lot of photos of them when I had them. I'm discovering now that this is probably due to their, um, their life cycle that I didn't quite realize before. So I'm not actually <laughs> as bad to them as I think. <laughs> and um, this is tiny and you would never, I never noticed that texture in those leaves um, before this. And this is actually um, a lilac before it opens. So um, very close up, definitely. Um, a lot of my work is more in the close up range, which Stephen will talk about coming up, but this is more in the macro range. And at the same time, same day, I was able to take um, a photo of the more winter look <laughs> of the same um, subject, actually on the same tree. So, um, you know, when you're considering your phases, thinking about what the shape of them as they open um, in this lily here, you know, you start with the bud and, and the angles that you're gonna be um, shooting at um, are gonna be different. And I know this, Stephen put this together for us. If, did you have something to add to? The idea of this? Yep. Just, okay. Yeah. 
Perfect. So shapes and forms, again, um, this flower uh, wasn't in the water. I'm not um, saying that should be your technique, but sometimes it happens and you should take advantage. This one is a cosmos flower. Um, and this is as I shot it. And here I want to show the texture on that brightest petal. So I have side light coming across, which is where you're gonna get your texture coming out. If you're ever looking um, to show texture on any subject, that's how you'll do it. And as I was shooting it, I was making sure I wasn't losing any detail there because that was gonna be my brightest area. And this is the way it was, she was hanging. And I show this because it, that version of it to me looks kind of sad and forlorn, but when you turn it, I feel like it has more of a resilient look. So sometimes, um, especially when you're shooting flowers, you don't have to worry about keeping your horizon line as we would in um, landscape or really anytime you can see a horizon line. You can tilt your camera to create your um, composition and sometimes afterwards you see something different as I did with this. And um, here we're gonna talk about flower forms coming up. And as you can see, there's just loads of different flower forms. And I like to approach my subject differently based on the forms. So we'll talk about that when we get there. And I think you're coming in with this one, right, Stephen? I'm, I'm gonna jump in and we're gonna start talking about macro, which is good because I'm, I'm looking in the, the Q&A and there's a lot of questions specific about lenses and some specific lenses. Um, Perfect focal length and what should you be using? Um, there's no right answer. It, right, the right answer is it depends and it depends on the look. And so we're gonna try and give an idea of why you would choose one over another. So um, when, we, when we use the term macro, uh, traditionally we're talking about a very specific one-to-one uh, -one macro or at, at least one-to-one -one macro. Um, when we talk about close-up photography, it's just that we're getting close to the subject. So one-to-one, -one, what, what is that, right? What is the idea of one-to-one? -one? Um, and the, I mean, we'll try and go a little bit deeper as we go, but the simple concept is the size of your subject in real life at one-to-one -one become is the same size as the image that's being projected onto your camera's sensor, right? So um, the, the, the example that I generally like to, to always use is I pull out a slide mount, right? So I've got a, a slide here and this is a 35 millimeter slide. So the, the dimensions of this slide are the same dimensions as a full frame 35 millimeter sensor camera. And so, if we're taking a picture of something at one-to-one, -one, right? So if I've got my sticker here and I wanna take a picture of the sticker at one-to-one, -one, the size of the sticker on like the picture is going to look just like this, right? We're gonna, um, we should get there. Um, <laughs> Say hopefully less blurry. <laughs> it's a technique. <laughs> it, it, yeah, so it's, we're going like the, this is the frame of our picture, right? That's what we're gonna end up with. So as I'm looking at flowers and the size of a flower, um, I'm thinking about how close I, I want to get and do I wanna crop right down in on tight onto one, one single bud or one single small section, right? So your, your lilac bud is a great example. I'm fairly confident that looks like it was probably shot at one-to-one -one or pretty close to it. Mm -hmm. um, the um, there are a bunch of different ways to get your to have your camera let you focus close closer and get you to that one to one magnification. Um, we can use uh, diopters, basically filters that go on the front of the lens that allow you to focus a little bit closer. Um, you can also add extension tubes, which are spacers that go on the back of your lens. Uh, that again, allow the camera to focus a little bit closer. Um, the drawback with both of those solutions is often that means that you can't focus far away, right? So the term we use is that you've, you've lost infinity focus, right? You can't, like the camera will no longer focus at a far away subject when you have one of these accessories, uh, either, the, either a diopter or extension tubes on there. 
And that can be, it can be okay because sometimes if we do want to just get in really tight, it's a, an easy way to get there. But sometimes we want to take a picture of just the little the center of the flower and just the uh, the pistol and the stamen, right? The little have the little beads of pollen on um, on the end of the flower. Sometimes that's the shot we want. But sometimes we want a picture of the flower in its setting and in its scene. And so for that, um, a macro lens is generally going to be your, your best bet. So um, macro lenses come in all different focal lengths and shapes and sizes and, and specialties. Um, but what we're looking at is, um, can it get to a one-to-one -one magnification? Right? Can, can it get to at least one-to-one -one magnification? And this sort of what makes the Laowa lenses special is Laowa doesn't stop at a one-to-one -one magnification with the majority of our macros. Um, most of our macro lenses allow you to get even closer and get down into a two-to-one macro, a two-to-one magnification. So um, sure, if you want to jump to the next one, um, the idea of going beyond a one-to-one. -one. So I didn't find a good image with flowers, so we got to deal with bugs. But if we think... <laughs> If we think if you about have flowers, you have bugs. <laughs> flowers and bugs definitely go together. So, um, so the first shot here, our grasshopper, um, right? If we think of the size of that grasshopper, its its width is going to be thirty six millimeters, right? So it's it's about that size. So if we were to take a picture of it at one to one, it's going to fill the that frame. That's the size of it, right? I can, if I were holding the little grasshopper, we can picture it fitting right inside that space. Um, as we start going to uh, this other little beetle here, it's a little bit smaller beetle, but we've gone down to a two to one magnification and we're able to still fill that frame at a two to one magnification. So the beetle is physically much smaller in real life. So in real life, it's about half the size of this frame. But when we go to a two to one magnification, we've magnified it and we're stretching it to fill up the whole entire frame of our image. And so that like, if we think about, all right, from, our, from your camera, how large a print can you make? So if I can make a 24 by 36 print from my Fuji X-T3 camera, right? That's about the biggest, I think I've done, done a 20 by 30 before. That's the biggest print I've made. But the camera can do it, no, no issue resolution wise. So now I can take this little tiny beetle at a two to one magnification and blow it up full, full frame to fill that 24 by 36 image. And so I can make these giant blow ups of relatively small objects. We get all the way down to this little tiny ant, um, right down under a centimeter uh, in width, but at a 5x magnification, um, we can get that to fill the frame. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so so the if we do, do one, one more, I do have my my one to one example of, of flowers, and this is a pretty good uh, render where the idea is that one at one to one, if we think of the size of a lot of different flowers, that's where we're able to get that close up, and then being able to go further um, just opens up the options, right? There's um, there are a lot of lenses that that may say. Uh, that, that may say they're a macro lens. Well, there's a bunch of zoom lenses out there, telephoto lenses that have a macro function. Um, and usually those are in the uh, one to two, one to three, one to four magnification ratio. So you're not, well, yes, it is close up. We gotta think about if like, right, if I've got a flower that's twice the size of my frame here, so I've got a good sized daisy or something, I'm going to be able to fill the frame with that daisy, right? If it's, if it's much bigger, it's going to end up um, not like, yeah, it's going to end up filling the frame at a two, at a one to two magnification. At a one to one magnification, that's where I can get down in on just the center of it and just those fine details there. So, um, as we get closer and closer to our subject, um, we end up one of the biggest uh, biggest things that we need to think about is our depth of field, um, right? And so the 
the depth of field we, we define as the amount of the image from foreground to background that is acceptably in focus. Um, and so we've got three different things that affect our depth of field. Um, I'm going to switch over here. Uh, all right. And if we can see, let's see if we can switch this. Do you need me to stop the share? Yeah, if you stop the share, and then we can, it looks like I'm spotlighted so we can see. Um, this is an app called Photo Pills. Um, if you've not heard of it, um, I highly recommend it for any sort of, um, uh, yeah, photo planning. If you've got different shots or things that you're trying to work out, um, this, I have, I have purchased this app on multiple times because I have it on both my Android phone and on my iPad because I, I, I it's worth it to me. It's, I think it's 10, 12 bucks. Um, but there are many, many different things that it can do. Um, but we're going to specifically look at depth of field here. So we've got three different factors that affect our depth of field. One is the focal length of our lens. Uh, the second here we've got is the aperture of our lens. And this is, this is probably the one if we've, if we've gone through a basic photo class, the aperture is the, the, the setting that we think of most to be controlling our depth of field. Um, but then also here's, here's where we start talking about macro is subject distance, right? The, the, the distance you are away from your subject affects how, how much, what the depth of field is. Um, so right now we're, we're looking at the little smiley face guy in the very middle here, um, that gives us, so given our settings, so I've got, um, I'm using a Nikon Z6 is what I've set the camera to. That's the camera that I've got in my hands right now. Um, we've got uh, a hundred millimeter lens is our focal length, right? So we've, um, I saw a question in there before, um, the difference between a 60 millimeter and a 100 millimeter um, lens, what's, what's the difference? Um, so the focal length is going to most directly affect our field of view, uh, right? And so if we have, uh, a subject that is 10 feet away from us and we're shooting it with a 100 millimeter lens and then we switch over to a 60 millimeter lens, we're going to have a wider field of view, right? We're going to see more area around that subject. Um, even if we get down like both at a one-to-one -one magnification, right? Even if we bring the, the camera all the way down um, to that one-to-one -one right on top of the subject, the 60 millimeter is going to give us a wider field of view. So we're gonna be able to see more image around the sides of it. The subject that is at that one to one may end up being the same size, but um, the area behind and the area around the subject will have a little more field of view there. Um, the, all right, so if I, right, so we said, if I switch from my 100 millimeter lens, I go down to a 60 millimeter lens. Um, we can see that our depth of field has increased quite a bit, right? From a, we went from about two meters is what we're talking about. Um, and for math's sake, we can just add a centimeter on top of anywhere it says meter. When we're thinking about macro here, we can just think of them as centimeters. Um, so we went from a two centimeter depth of field, just over two centimeters, to pretty close to a nine centimeter depth of field, um, going from, uh, right, our subject distance hasn't changed, our aperture hasn't changed, but we've just gotten, uh, we, we've gone to a wider angle lens, to a 60 millimeter focal length. So we have a much wider uh, depth of field. Um, if we adjust our aperture, right, we go from f14, let's say we don't have much light, so we're going to go down and shoot it at f4. Um, now we've brought our depth of field back down under two centimeters, right, we've gone back down to a very narrow depth of field. Um, and then we've got our, our subject distance. As our subject distance changes, um, we can change it. So if we go from five, here we've got meters, but let's call it centimeters. And if I go to 10, uh, 10 meters, uh, 
it work there? There it is. Um, right, we went from, again, we're looking at that little smiley face in the middle. We went from having uh, under two centimeters of depth of field, but by doubling our subject distance back in the camera away a little bit, um, we've, we've got a lot more depth of field, um, right? So our, the three things that we're looking here that, at, that, that affect our depth of field, subject distance, aperture, and focal length. Um, and when we're playing around with subject distance, it can have some very, very extreme effects. Um, Cheryl, if you want to share again, I'm going to switch back over here. Perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, so look at so look, we can look at some examples of um, of the of aperture and subject distance and focal length all having an effect on our depth of field. Um, so the first image we've got coming up is um, I just shot last week. This is shot at um, a one to one uh, macro with uh, allow a fifteen millimeter. Uh, wide angle lens. So this is this is a pretty funky lens. Um, so it, it's a it's an ultra wide angle. So it's a full frame, fifteen millimeter, um, very large of field of large field of view. So we're getting a lot of like a lot of the image into and on the subject. So um, basically, uh, this dandelion is pushed right up against the front element of the lens. Um, you can, we can see some of the, the, the petals that are sort of uh, directing towards the camera. Those are actually being pushed up against the front element. The, the, the near focus on the lens is about a centimeter away. Um, so comparing these two images, so now we've just jumped, um, the subject distance hasn't changed. The focal length is still a 15 millimeter, but we've gone from an F32 aperture on the previous one where we had, a, it wasn't sharp in the background, but we could make it out, right? We can see the house, we can see the trees and, and it's blurred, but we can still see it. That's an F32, very, very small aperture, small lens opening. Now we've gone to an F4, right? And now we are at just a narrow, narrow, thin little slice of that flower that's in focus. Um, so subject distance and focal length not changing, but just using the aperture to adjust and control our depth of field. Um, so when we're closing the aperture to get that larger depth of field, um, that means that we need to be adding more light. Um, that's, that's one of the challenges is that to get any sort of depth of field in macro photography, often we need to add more light to our subject. Um, and that is not without its challenges. Um, but we're going to, we'll talk about light in a little bit. Uh, so we're, we're going to look at subject distance next. Um, so this is, this is one of my shots of, um, it, it is, uh, basically the, the inside of a daisy. Not, it wasn't quite a daisy, but, um, it, yeah, it's the, the little, um, yeah, this is where I'm bad. <laughs> but uh, it was a it was a, a black eyed Susan, but it was yellow, like the little yellow balls, textures and shapes. And so this is shot at a two to one macro. Um, and so my subject distance, I am um, maybe an inch away from the subject, right? The, the working distance, the front element of my lens is probably about an, in, about an inch away from the subject. And again, we see that very, very narrow, shallow depth of field. Um, yeah, let's, so let's jump to that next one because this is a great example of subject distance affecting depth of field and where it works. Um, so we're gonna look at this first image here. We are- um, I like the way this, you know, I, the fact that you can make an abstract out of mm -hmm. a very common mm -hmm. um, subject and you can't necessarily identify it. I think that is very, a very interesting thing you can do when, when you're getting close in the macro. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when I, yeah, did you want to go ahead? No, go ahead. These are your okay. shots and I love the example. Well, I, 
I photographed this, um, not with this in mind, but, you know, we all know that the subject distance does um, play a role, but I just wanted something visual to, um, to show that. And I thought about when I was photographing this and the fact this is a lupine or lupin. Um, and it's very, the details in the flower are very interesting. And I love the, the, the leaves as well. So I wanted to show that really close up. So the, um, my settings here, obviously this was inside because this one second, I was on a tripod, um, F14, ISO 100, 105 macro. Um, and someone I did see in the comments um, was asking, I do use a crop sensor camera. I do like that extra reach into my images. Um, so for those technical bits, um, there's that. And when I was photographing this, I, this, this flower is tall, which is can be um, a challenge if you want to get the whole thing in and be close up. So I'd step back to try and get the whole thing. And you can see I step back, I would say two to three feet. I wasn't measuring, but that's that's pretty profound change, I think, with how much more depth of field you're getting. But when I went and looked at my EXIF, because I wasn't trying to prove this point when I was photographing, I wanted to try and keep those the background leaves a little bit more out of focus and stuff in the front so that it wouldn't be as distracting. I don't think that was the right choice, but that's what I did at the time. Um, but I had opened it up to F3.2. So even with a much wider aperture, that distance made a huge difference. Um, and that's why I like to show this particular example with that. And I'll take it, I'll send it back to you. <laughs> All right. So, right, so we're, like we've, we've said, as we're getting closer and closer to our subject, that depth of field is getting narrower and narrower. And so um, the depth of field, how, like, where is it? What is it? it? It is a plane, right? It is a plane that is parallel to the sensor of your camera. Um, so if we keep our subject parallel to the sensor, right? So we shoot flat against the subject, even with that shallow depth of the field, like we, we can, you can start to see at the ends of the petals here where they start to curl where they, they exit that depth of field and you can see a little bit of a blur at the, at the tips. Um, but for the most part, the whole flower falls within my acceptable focus range. As soon as I go to an angle and go to the side a little bit, now I can see where that slice comes in um, and we're cutting, cutting across the flower. So we're just seeing part of it in focus and anything in the foreground and anything in the background ends up falling out of the depth of field. Um, Joel, can you hit that one? There we go, right? Same, same exact flower, same situation, same settings. Um, I'm just shooting it from a different angle. Right, and my depth of field, because I'm staying in, like the first shot, I'm staying in line with the subject, everything stays in focus. But now when I've gone to a, a separate plane and now this, the subject is crossing across that, that plane and across that depth, now I'm only getting that thin slice of the flower in focus. So um, the things that we're paying attention to as we're shooting, how could I get a larger depth of field here? Um, I could shoot this with a wider angle lens. Um, that would give me, right, if I'm shooting with the, the 100 millimeter, um, I might switch over to a 60 millimeter to get a little bit larger depth of field. Um, I'm gonna get a different field of view. So I may have to recompose and in recomposing, I may end up deciding that I wanna get closer to the subject now to get the same, uh, same image. And now that I've gotten close to the subject, I'm going to, I'm likely going to get rid of any of the advantage of the wider focal length lens that I had. Um, the other thing, so with a longer focal, focal length lens, um, one, of, one of the things that is going to change for me there also is I'm generally going to get a longer working distance, right? And so the, the distance between the front element of my lens 
and where my subject ends up falling to get the same magnification ratio. So um, 100 millimeter traditionally ends up being a pretty happy medium, um, but there are certainly there are macro photographers, um, a lot of the bug photographers out there, they like having longer focal lengths so that they don't have to be right on top of their subject. Um, but I like at the same time, I've been playing around with the 15 millimeter Lawa one-to-one -one macro, very different look, um, but still giving that, that macro effect. So, um, but the working distance is right on top of the lens, right? The literally to get down to a one-to-one, -one, I'm putting the subject right on top of the front element. I can still been work within any range too. there. Yeah, you've been playing with the 15. I'm excited to see some of the stuff that you've, you've got. Well, the, the flowering trees, it's wonderful for that. You know, like the cherry mm. trees, that kind of thing. Um, because, But I'm trying to focus and all of a sudden I see it move because I touched it with the lens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's fun though. It's, yes, yes. I, I will definitely be bringing the 15 millimeter next week to uh, to play with because yeah. it is it is a cool lens and it's a different, we think of traditional macro always being in that 60, 100 to 150 millimeter range. And so throwing a 15 millimeter into that space, it's, uh, I don't know of any other, I don't believe there are any other manufacturers that have done uh, an ultra wide angle lens that also does a macro even close to what the Lawa will do. So, um, I know I've, I've had the opportunity to play with a couple of those and the, the wide angle macro thing takes some getting used to, but it is pretty wild. Yeah, it's it. Um, I I can I'm, I'm I'll, I'll avoid my Lawa soapbox, but um, <laughs> Lawa Lawa makes lenses that push into the periphery and push into what like push outside of what's been possible, right? The the whole idea of going to a two to one macro and having a normal macro lens that just doesn't stop at a one to one, it lets you focus closer. Um, that was so that's the, the first lens that we made was a 60 millimeter two to one macro eight years ago. Um, and and so the, the macro idea is sort of in our DNA and pushing into weird areas so the wide angle 5x ultra macro um, and then the, the probe lens, which if you're aware of it, um, if you've watched a, uh, a Coke or Pepsi or potato chip commercial in the last few years, you've seen work done with that Lawa probe lens. Um, it's, yeah, the really cool things that you can do with it that just, there aren't other lens manufacturers making stuff in this space. So um, I'm excited for the people who are coming out to get your hands on it and play with it. So um, that's gonna, that's a good lead into focus. Um, so one of the main disadvantages of Lawa lenses is that we are all manual focus. Um, so for our focus settings, we've got, uh, we can go with autofocus or manual focus. Um, if we're going to go with autofocus, which I would, I generally am going to say, as you're getting closer to your subject, you're going to be more inclined to switch over to manual focus. Um, the, uh, it's a couple different factors. Um, but one of, the, one of the big ones is that shallow depth of field, right? When we're dealing with such a shallow depth of field, with the camera's autofocus system, you can give it a point to focus on, but it's going to struggle to hold it into that spot. Or if you're just going with a general area autofocus, it's jumping around to so many different spots that it's, it's frustrating to try and get your, your focus right to the exact point that you want. So um, we're gonna use a single, if we're using autofocus, we're gonna use a single point autofocus. We're gonna select and tell the camera where we want it to go. Um, we're gonna use that back button focus. Uh, that's right? that's what goes. I do, yeah. Yes. Um, I like to do that because you can focus and then refine and without refocusing every time. Is, right, yeah. So that, that back button focus, we're pressing the button to focus and then if we press the shutter button, we've turned off the half press autofocus so that we can just press the shutter button and take the picture and the camera is not going to autofocus again. It's going to function a little bit more like if we had it in manual focus, but we just have to push the back button to autofocus again and, and wake that up. Um, 
yeah, so, yeah so, the, I might I might be sitting there kind of doing one of these <laughs> if you see me photographing, which there's nothing wrong. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> <focus. laughs> I I go more so I'm 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 shooting pretty much all Lawa lenses because that's where I'm at. And so I'm shooting all manual focus. Um, and I'm also doing similarly, I'll I'll be leaning into a subject and I'll be moving and adjusting around because I'll set my focus distance. I'll set the, the amount of magnification I want, and then I can lean in and out to sort of move the move that focal plane to the point at which I want it in um, and, and be adjusting through. Um, with modern mirrorless cameras, it is easier to manually focus than it has ever been at any point in the past. Um, between tools like focus peaking, where the camera is looking at all the pixels on the sensor, looking at the readout and finding the highest points of contrast between pixels. And if it, see, if it finds a point with acceptably high contrast between two pixels, it's gonna make them glow in red or you can choose different colors on, on, on different cameras and depending on your scene, right? If you're shooting red roses, you don't want the focus peaking to glow red, you might probably want it to glow blue. So you can switch it to have those pixels where it's like where, where it finds a specifically sharp area, have that glow blue, then you know that that is generally the area where you're in focus. And then the other tool that you get is the ability um, on a mirrorless camera in live view, you can zoom in to one small area of the sensor, move into one small section and judge and tell and say, all right, is this in focus? Is this sharp? By looking down at just one little tiny area you've zoomed in on, even though your whole picture may be the, the scene, but you're looking at just very finely getting your focus onto that one small point in the middle. So. Um, yeah, uh, different focus tools we will talk about, uh, at the end, but here, yeah, Cheryl can pick up. So where should you place your focus? I'm going to go through, um, the forms of flowers and sometimes the form of the flower is going to dictate that for me, but it's also going to be my intent. Um, if I am on a tripod and I want to show everything in focus, um, I will use like a hyperfocal distance concept where I'm trying to find a place about a third of the way in to get as much depth of field as I can. Um, if I am shooting narrow depth of field and um, I have whatever's closest to my lens is where I want focus to be generally. Um, if I'm showing the center of my flower ever, I find that that needs to be in focus. So um, like I said, if, you, if I'm bringing attention to slight details, that's when I'm gonna use the limited depth of field um, and I'll use a wider aperture. Um, so a low F number. The way I personally work is um, if I'm outside, I, I tend to work with a limited depth of field handheld. Um, it just allows me to move quicker. And um, for me, I like to be on a tripod. <laughs> I like to be very methodical and it's a way to challenge me, challenge myself to, to do something different. So again, like if I want to see all the details, I'm going to go for maximum depth of field. I'll be you know a little bit farther away if I can, especially if it's a bigger subject. Um, shoot that narrow aperture. And um, if you want the entire subject in focus, um, you know, sometimes if you're really close, you're gonna need other strategies like focus stacking um, to be able to get everything in. Um, if you don't wanna go that way, then you, then you need to make some compromises um, by stepping back. If you don't have enough light and there's any movement either in your camera or in your uh, subject, you know, wind, or if it's handheld, then adding light will help you freeze um, your subject when you have those narrow apertures. So talking about the flower forms, um, I kind of came up with these um, based off of um, gardening concepts and flower arranging, um, but also with an eye to like different ways I would um, approach 
these subjects. So the ball form, this is a dahlia and also like roses, um, basically something that's dense and you can't really get light into. So soft overall light, you know, is generally gonna be nice for um, most flowers. Um, but in this case, it's hard to get a dramatic light on it. I have done like a red rose um, with bracketing because that was the way that I was able to get the light into the dark center and without losing all detail along, around the edges. Um, but like I said, roses, the same kind of that ball flower form where you're not gonna get light inside of it necessarily, a nice soft um, light. So we have a rose and a mum. Um, yeah, they were all, the rose was, just right after the rain. Um, probably the dahlia was just in a shaded area um, on a sunny day. And the mum was in um, our botanical gardens, which they, um, you look at their windows and they look dirty, but they actually spray them to uh, protect the flowers from, or the, any of the plants from getting burned by the sun. And it, it helps us uh, as photographers too. <laughs> so flower forms discs, uh, that's, Stephen showed those uh, a daisy before and how, you know, if you shoot it straight down, you can, you can show more in focus um, than when you're working at an angle. And here I've kind of um, compromised halfway between. Um, I have that tiny little ant on there. And a lot of people say that um, once you have a bug in your image, it's about the bug. <laughs> but this, this particular one, I still think it's about the flower because it's so tiny. But, but it's a little bit about the story of both. Um, and here we're straight on with the disc. Um, even though it's not quite the same exact flower form, we're looking at the same idea. And this is a fall blooming anemone, Japanese anemone. And uh, I think they look very spring-like, which is why I mentioned that they bloom in the fall. Um, and this is a native, a local native, um, the New England aster. And again, that's fall blooming. Um, and here I have the center of the flower in focus um, and the petals are falling out more. But with this flower form, um, there is that opportunity to turn it to the side. This one's actually a Gerber daisy, so it's bigger, which allows me to get really close to just those um, small slice of the petal um, and let the rest of it kind of fall out of. So as you're working, you may not like all of these different styles, but they're just different options and opportunities um, as you work. Elongated discs, um, I see it as, you know, the daisy form, but just um, the cone flowers to tend to uh, to have this look. Um, and sometimes the more disc form, like the uh, Brown Eyed Susan, as it, as it um, ages, will kind of do that too. Um, these have, you have a little bit more latitude for bringing light um, through the petals or rim lighting, back lighting, which I didn't show you any of that here, but this is just overall soft lighting. And a flower form of a cup, uh, like a tulip, those are something blooming outside now. We can get, a, we can get them now. Um, I didn't have a good example of, but what I was thinking of with the cup is that lighting from the top, bringing your light in from the top will give you a glow inside of your flower. Uh, you can see a little bit of it here. This is actually a backlit flower. Um, and that's something I know that Stephen's gonna help people work through if they're interested. Um, what I like to do in this scenario is think of my background as my light source. Most of the time it actually is a light source. It can be a soft box. Um, it can be a light pad. Um, we tested out some LED uh, panels. Um, if there's texture on them and you put a um, diffuser on top, that's enough to lose the texture and still be able to get this um, effect. And this particular one, you can see the sheen on the front of the flower. And that's because I do have an additional light source coming in front. When you do that, you want to be careful. It's not too bright. So you, 
if you're close to that background, you might start creating a shadow or you'll lose the glow if you're looking for a glow through, um, through your tulip. What I discovered when I was going through my files is I, I like to shoot tulips as they have already opened up. So <laughs> I don't have as much latitude for the glow inside, but I'll show you another form that I think of that you can do that too. So uh, this is um, photographed with um, off-camera flash to give you the sheen there. Um, I do have a black background behind this. Um, uh, <laughs> velvet, there we go, <laughs> that typical word. Um, that is a nice way to be able to really absorb any light that, especially if you're using a higher powered light. Um, you can use papers, um, but any light on it will start bringing it to a gray color instead of leaving it at black. Um, if you have your um, light source, I know um, Stephen's gonna have the Godox system and um, you can, you don't even need a background. If, you, if you're lighting directly and you're not spilling, you have enough space behind you, um, you don't even need a background. Um, you can look for instances when you're shooting outside, if your your subject is in the light, and even if, if it's light colored, even better. And if your background's in the shadows, you can sometimes achieve that look um, that way as well. And if you have tulips, let them just stay in the vase until they're done, because sometimes they do some really cool things. So those were all just sitting in the vase, they dried that way. And again, shot with my uh, background as a light source and you start to get some glow through them that way too, because they're, they're thin. Um, same way uh, Stephen had talked about with the orchids, um, that single layer. And tubes, um, again, these aren't these are things I made up based on what I was thinking at the time. Um, and, and this is photographing with, um, being able to create a glow in there. So this particular calla lily was um, still on the plant right up against um, the foundation of the house. And so stopped way down. I had an off camera flash again and I'm directing it directly down into the flower. So you can see, that's how you see this texture really well. And that's a nice illustration of like when the light hits it front on, you that you can see there's some texture there, but it doesn't highlight it as much as when you have the backlight that's going through the flower. It really highlights that texture a little more. And again, these are on a, a white or a light source. Um, they were actually laying down, which allowed me to give that arrangement. But again, you can see where I can bring the light through the petal. It's, it's not technically a petal. The actual flower is just this little piece peeking up in there and it's um, a specialized leaf that looks like a flower or it looks like a petal. Um, and then the last one here is a petunia. And this one was actually photographed outside. Um, the light source was the sun, kind of up and behind. So it's coming down through the center of it. And that again, allows you to see this texture in here. And a little bit of the rim light is just hitting the hairs down at the bottom, but you can see the how different that is from where the light is not hitting the same um, details up higher. So the rim light really helps um, bring any kind of like there's pasque flowers have have a very uh, almost furry texture to them, and they're they're really beautiful when you have that backlight on them. I don't have a sample of that yet, but I have a plant, so maybe next year. <laughs> um, and here's this um, lupine we looked at before and the spike flower form, as you'll see, I am usually shooting it. So it's um, in a portrait um, orientation. Um, and this allows me to step back further. Um, and I, as Stephen said with, you know, when you're photographing bugs, a lot of times people like to have that extra distance um, to not spook the bug. But I think working with flowers, oftentimes, especially if you're in someone else's garden or a botanical garden, um, you don't wanna step in 
the garden space itself too. So it's nice to have that extra reach with that as well. Um, again, this is um, this is called lamb's ear, and the, I was able to in this instance. So the first one, I had a painted background behind it. So as I'm trying to bring in more details in the flower, what you end up sometimes bringing in as details in your background. So that can be a compromise sometimes. With the lamb's ear, it was, they're kind of a mat forming uh, perennial. So I was able to fill the background with more of them, um, which helped me, um, you know, not only have detail in the subject, but have a non-distracting background. Uh, this one on the left here is Snapdragon, and I was, you know, working very uh, specifically to photograph that I had um, a line of the blooms in focus and choosing an angle that would allow me to have that little um, extra new stock there um, also in focus. And then the background is just others out of focus. So you know, when you want to bring, if you're working in the fields or working outside in situ, I guess we'll say, um, part of the reason why I like to work with a narrower aperture or less stuff the field is, it's easier to hide the stuff in the background if it's not um, pretty, <laughs> um, which you, will, you can find that a lot. Um, so if you want to show more in, in focus, definitely um, that's a compromise that you have to, you may not get the angle you want with the background. And here, again, you can see the centers of these flowers. So that's where I'm placing my focus and I'm letting anything in front or in back um, kind of fall out. And where these other ones, I have more of a closed composition where I'm showing the entire um, subject. This one I've stepped in and I have more of an open composition where the subject is coming out of the frame. And this is a delphinium, which is a very tall spike. Um, there would be tons of distractions, especially because I made the mistake of uh, planting it right next to my siding. <laughs> um, so clusters, um, that is, um, this particular one is an orchid, very tiny orchid, the light source is behind. Um, and you can kind of see some of the rim light, it's behind and above. And that, that gives us the, the light through um, this material here. I do also have something reflecting light back in. And I see that I'm running short on time, so I'm gonna speed this up. We have, um, this is an orchid where it was in the botanical gardens. And um, as I'm focusing, or as I'm metering off the, um, flower, I'm able to take the ceiling, the glass ceiling, um, and blow it into white. Um, here I've made a choice to the clusters in the middle, um, keep them in focus and things are falling out of focus, you know, forward and back. And that might not be a good choice for everyone, but this was actually as these were growing on the plant. So I wanted to show it that way. Um, a different thing you could do is bring the farthest, uh, you know, the, the flower that's farthest away um, on the, the stalk here and, and focus there and let the rest fall out. And here, uh, this is with a macro lens and extension tubes. So that's a lilac, definitely way down in it. Um, it was actually breezy and it was still on the plant. So that was, <laughs> there was a lot of hit and miss factor as well. Um, and the last form we're gonna talk about is the lily form. And that tends to be really big and with a lot of detail. Uh, so for this one, I was actually uh, quite a distance back. And I'm during the day um, at F16, at F2, uh, at F16 with uh, my shutter speed was uh, one two fiftieth of a second. And I had, again, I was hand holding um, an off-camera flash and just um, photographing up into the flower, which here again, as with the cups and the um, tubes, 
um, I get that glow through there. And again, hand holding that there was, there was some trial and error to get it, but I was able to be back far enough with my aperture closed down enough that I'm getting the center and the closed petals in focus. Um, this one was more closed up and that was my um, compromise there. And this was inside on, um, with just window light. Uh, Daylily, again, with that, that white background backlight, you can see how um, the light is coming through. The, the petals, it is not um, a true lily, but it has the same type of form. So the same type of challenges with um, the center parts, something you usually wanna see in focus. Um, and then trying to render the petals as well in focus. Um, an amaryllis is, a, is the same type of thing. This one, we got really, really close. Because it's big, um, it was easier to do that and really select a small area. And this is a native uh, toad lily, very, very tiny. Um, so even though this, the area around it was very distracting, uh, where they, they grow is, you know, grasses and you don't want to step on any of them, but um, they typically tilt kind of down too. So it was, it was some work to get there, but it, because it's so small, you can, you were able, I was able to get a lot of the petals, the important parts of the petals and the center. And so thinking as you're going through, thinking about the angle of your subject is important. And this was just one calla lily that I photographed many times and one leaf. And then I composited them here. And I just think that that is um, an interesting way to see how much a flower can change based on just how you turn it when you're photographing. So as you're looking for your angle to shoot from, it's um, something to think about. So we talked about stabilizing the camera because as when you get close, um, to your subject, tiny movements are magnified. Um, and there are a few ways to do this. Uh, tripod is a very smart way to do it. Um, it gets a steady base for your camera and you're not gonna get blur from camera shake most of the time. <laughs> Allows for longer shutter speeds to compensate for low light. I, I, if I'm photographing flowers or most anything inside, I'm on a tripod because I like I don't tend to photograph things that move. <laughs> I do still life, I do flowers. Um, and I can, ha I have a lot of um, latitude when I have a long shutter speed. I can light paint, um, I can composite different things together. Um, and if I you know, have a scene that I've set up and I would decide this little thing needs to be over here, I can do that very easily without having a different camera angle where if I were coming in with the camera, it might be different. It might take me some time to replicate my camera angle. And that gives me maximum depth of fields. As I mentioned before, light painting is an option. So for a handheld, um, for me, I when I'm hand holding my 105 macro, I'm at 250th of a second at minimum. Um, some people might be more stable. Some people might need a faster shutter speed. Um, as I said before, I have enough light when I'm working outside to do that. And it gives me flexibility when creating compositions. Um, and I'm able to refine, refine my point of view quickly. You know, if I notice something weird in the background, I can just move. Um, it's easier for me when I'm handheld outside. And I, I tend to use the shallow depth of field, but sometimes even getting shallow depth of field is an F8. Um, so it does uh, limit your, your light. Um, so you can definitely raise your ISO um, or add accessory lighting, um, which will definitely free you from looking for light or worrying about your ISO or any of that stuff. Um, it makes it much easier. And I'll turn it back over to Stephen. 
So yeah, so on the, the tripod topic, I, um, my general rule that I don't always follow, but the general rule is for macro, if my subject is moving, I want my camera to be moving, if my pod. Um, it just makes things a lot easier. Um, one of the other, like as we get down into our ultra macro ranges, one to one and beyond. Um, uh, so this is a tool, uh, it's a macro rail. Um, the big one there is the one that I recommend that I use. I've, I've used a whole bunch of different ones. Um, and then this, this is the Nisi uh, macro rail. N-I-S-I -I is the, the manufacturers. Um, you can get it from Dan's. It's uh, $130 ish. Um, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to very slowly adjust the distance from your, of your camera to the subject. And so you can very make very fine adjustments um, and to, to get that focal plane, to get your focus exactly where you want it in exactly that spot. It also, if you want to take multiple images at different distances, you can uh, shoot at, at those diff diff distant, different distances much easier. Um, and as we go, we'll, we'll touch on why you might want to do that in a minute. Um, uh, after the macro rail, one of the, the other accessories um, is, uh, this is a plant, uh, so a, a plant clamp. Um, so one is if you're, if you're outside to stabilize the subject, uh, blocking the wind. Uh, so I meant to have my reflector, I guess I've got a reflector behind me over here, but uh, using a reflector to block light certainly is good, but also uh, using a reflector to to block wind, right? To, because every little movement, every little shake is going to show up. So um, if you're out in the field shooting, uh, using something to block the wind to, to help stabilize, uh, but then also using something like this where it's it's got a, a jaw clamp on one side, but then it's got this other uh, soft clamp with a, it's like a spongy material on the inside that's designed to hold on to a flower, hold on to a plant without damaging it. Um, so uh, yeah, so stabilizing your, your camera with a tripod, with a per rail, stabilizing the subject with something like the plant, blocking light, um, and then uh, continuing to stabilize their subject uh, is gonna be using a remote um, or taking a pic, finding some way to trigger the camera to take the picture without actually touching the camera. Because even that simple act of, pressing down on the shutter button can introduce enough vibration that it will blur the image. Um, so we can use the so, sort of one of the simplest uh, th things that you can do that doesn't require any additional equipment is setting the camera into a self timer mode, um, right? I'll use the two second self timer to um, uh, have it set so where I can set the camera press the shutter button down, and then two seconds later, it'll take the picture. Uh, with my ultra macro lens, the, the, uh, the 25 millimeter when I'm down at 5X, uh, sometimes two seconds isn't long enough for the camera to stop that little bit of shake. Um, so if I'm using that, I'm either, I either want to be using another remote or I'll turn the shutter release all the way up to 10 seconds. So I can press the shutter button and then step away, back away from the setup. Um, because at those ultra macros, every little shake is dramatic. Um, so we can use a wired remote, something that's going to plug into the camera, and then we have a, a trigger that we can we can use. Um, wireless remotes uh, are going to be a remote that we can use, and same idea. We're going to have a part that's going to plug into the camera and part that's separate and wireless. Um, you can use the the phone app. Right? A lot of times now, modern cameras, we have an app. We can connect to our phone via Bluetooth and or Wi-Fi um, and then get a live view of our image even. Um, so we can see the picture and then and press the button to trigger the remote again without touching the camera and introducing that shake. Um, and then also using an intervalometer is another type of remote that allows us to program in a series of shots. 
Um, if we wanted to do a series at different exposure values, if we wanted to do a, a series over time, we can do some, some different things as well there. Um, so why we want to take multiple pictures at different uh, at different focal planes, right? With with uh, at, with at different points along the focal plane being in focus, um, is we can use a tool, uh, a technique called focus stacking, where we can take multiple pictures um, at different distances or with different focal planes, where different parts of the image are in focus, um, and then use software to actually um, to actually take those images and similar to we talked about the idea of um, focus peaking where the camera is looking for the sharpest pixel contrast between two pixels. Um, in focus stacking is taking all of the images. So you, you take a whole series of images at different distances with different focal planes um, and then you align them. You select, you select your images, then you can align them all into um, a single image on different layers. Uh, and then uh, in uh, Photoshop does it, if you have Photoshop, there's other software out there that can do it as well, that goes through and, and on that stack looks for areas of the image that, okay, so in this area, um, which of all of our image images have the, 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 uh, the, the most or the sharpest pixels for these pixels. And then it'll move over to the next pixels and then it'll look at all the different uh, images in the stack and find the sharpest pixels in that area. Um, and it's, it's kind of like magic. I, I, um, it can be intimidating to, to think about what it's doing and it feels very complex. Um, it is actually very easy to do. The complexity comes in perfecting it and, and getting it to look really good. So, um, I definitely encourage everyone that if you're even remotely interested in uh, macro photography, flower photography, try and shoot a couple images, shoot, shoot like eight images, just slowly leaning in, take a picture, lean further, picture, 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 picture at all different distances, and then put that into Photoshop and let it do the focus stacking. There's lots of simple two minute tutorials available. Um, but pretty much the software really does it for you. The fine is there tuning. An aperture and, that you recommend? Um, the aperture is going to depend on how many different slices you want to take, right? So if you want to take, um, if you only want to take five images, you probably want to be at a smaller aperture to have a larger depth of field, um, so that you can. And then you then you don't. So you have a larger depth of field, so you don't need as many stacks to put in there. Um, so that we, we can switch up to this next image here. This is an interesting one that I did um, last week. This is this is the orchid from the very beginning of the shot, um, right? So so here she is. I've got um, black background. We can see that the the flower petals in the back are in focus, um, and as we move to the middle and the foreground, we are out of focus. Now we've moved to the middle, and now we're we're sharp in the middle portion, the main main chunk of the flower is what's sharp. Um, and then we go to the next image and we can see that the very front is what's sharp. So this, these are just three sample images out of 100 or about a, out of 98 images that I shot. Uh, that sounds like a lot, but I used the brand new Olympus OM-1 camera uh, that has a setting that it will shoot 120 frames per second. Um, in, in JPEG, so it's not raw, but I'm not going to focus stack raw. That's another end of the story of choking up a computer and trying to add too, too much information and trying to get too much out of it. So um, shot all JPEG, but all I did for this shot was I lined up the image. I had it shooting, uh, I think it was set to 90 frames per second for this, um, line up the shot and just lean into the subject. That's all I'm doing to get those stacks. And if I lean in and over the course of a second, I lean through the subject, I have 98 images now, um, each taken at a different slice of the image. Um, and so then the next shot we can see um, is my focus stack. So that's taking, um, I think about 90 of the images all together. 
and just letting software go to it. It does a really good job. There's a couple of areas where we can see um, sort of at the top, there's some spots where uh, it go, it's sharp on the pedal and then goes blurry for a section and then gets sharp again. Um, and so I probably have an area of the image where I do have the, that blurry area is sharp and I would just need to go back and manually find that section um, and bring that in. So um, yeah, that's the new, new OM1. Um, this past year I've done, I've been working on my snowflake photography, um, which is at, uh, so that is at a 5X macro to start. Um, to get a, a little tiny snowflake sharp and your, your focus stacking. Um, but this is a technique that I'm really excited to start to use is that high speed shooting in a focus stack. Um, as I've been talking about focus stacking, I did see a, a question show up about um, in camera focus stacking. Um, and so that is a tool like when, um, there's a handful of manufacturers, I know Nikon and Fuji and um, somebody else have in-camera focus stacking tools where what they will do is they will um, make micro adjustments to the focus um, and where the focus is, not the distance between the camera and your subject. And so if you're trying to get the closest possible focus, if you're down there at that one-to-one -one or at a two-to-one focus or two-to-one uh, magnification, then you probably want to use um, the... Uh, adjust your, your distance to, to get that focus stack, um, but the, the autofocus adjustments or the focus adjustments in, a, in an in-camera focus stacking can do a pretty good job. Um, I've, I've played with my Fuji before. Um, the, one, the one drawback certainly is you do need a lens that will autofocus. Um, so you do need a macro lens that has autofocus functionality to be able to use that because it's changing the focus position as it's doing all those stacks. Um, so focus stack, um, lighting, um, we're gonna get more into this as when we go hands-on, um, but the concept of lighting and one of the biggest challenges that I personally have had trying to, trying to introduce artificial lighting in macro is um, the concept of the inverse square law. Um, we talk about inverse square law with um, uh, in uh, portraiture a lot, right? We're in a studio setting and we're moving lights around and, and positioning lights. Uh, and the concept simply is that every time if we bring a light and we take it and move it twice the distance away from our subject, the amount of light that's actually falling on that subject is going to be reduced by four, right? So, so it's going to be two full stops of light dis difference. So when we're dealing with portraiture, and I'm, I'm here in a portrait studio, and so I've got space. If I bring my, my light five feet away from the subject, and then I move the fight light, maybe I move it back, um, back a foot, it's not going to have a drastic difference on my image. Um, when I'm shooting macro, and I've got a light that is five inches away from the subject and I move it back a foot, uh, the amount of light now falling on the subject has dropped um, by eight, right? I've, I've more than doubled the, the distance. Um, so if I've, I'm go I've now gone to a much larger distance, um, yeah, but the light that's actually getting there, um, it falls off very quickly. Also, if I bring my light right in on top of a flower, right in on top of the subject, a subject like, so if I've got, if, if my light is two inches away from the subject and then I've got another flower that is the same color, same light, same brightness behind that subject, it's another two inches behind it. The amount of light that's going to hit that subject behind it is two full stops of light less, right? And so, it has big impact on our shadows and, and positioning the light. As we get lights closer, they fall off more. And so, so before Cheryl was talking about being able to use the, 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 the Godox light kit that I'm going to bring and I've got um, to be able to get lights right down on top of your subject, 
that makes it super, super easy to get a black background because you've got light right on top of the subject, really, really bright. It's going to fall off quickly, right? It's not, even if there is light hitting the background, when we're exposing for the subject right in front of us, any light that's hitting that background, we're not going to be exposing for. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, as we're lighting and depending on the look that we're going for, what we're trying to create, um, we need to be thinking about how close we're getting the light to the subject and also how big our light is and how much we can get it to wrap around the subject, um, right? Using a great big soft box and a big light that will wrap around your subject is going to be, um, yeah, it is going to be a different look than having a single point light source and having it spread across and create more dramatic shadows. So um, yeah, everybody that's coming out next week, we're gonna, or uh, on Saturday this, this weekend, um, we're gonna get some good hands-on with a couple different lighting scenarios and setups. So um, yeah, light, lighting is, there's a lot of trial and error with it. You can get into the, into the theory and the concepts of it, but, um, you definitely want to get your hands on to it for sure. So um, here's the little, this is the Godox MF12. This is the light kit that I have sort of fallen in love with. Um, I have four different, four lights that go on the ring. Um, and what's nice is you can use them on the ring light or you can take them off, um, add them to the background and they work with the, uh, the Godox uh, lighting system. So you can get additional mono lights to light your background and um, build around that whole system. So um, that's the, the Godox. Uh, we can jump through. There's our, our macro with the Godox. The kit comes with a bunch of different filters and accessories all the way through that you, you're gonna need. And then here we go. I'll let Cheryl take this, uh, take the quote. I just thought that this was um, relevant to uh, macro and to um, working, you know, not only photographing what it looks like, but um, trying to add your own interpretation to it. So um, as we get close with macro, you see some, you may see things you've never seen before. And I think that's really interesting. So I like this quote from Edward Weston, which is why limit yourself to what your eyes see when you have an opportunity to extend your vision. And that's all I have for that. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Uh, so questions. I've got the Q and A up. I'll I'll start trying to go through a couple of them. Um, so first of all, thanks so much. That was a ton of good information. It was so cool to see all these pictures and all these examples. Um, and I got to say that, like Cheryl, looking at your pictures, I can see the graphic designer background and the precision <laughs> and the composition, and like it it absolutely shows in there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So I know we got a few questions right at the beginning, uh, specifically about that one-to-one -one macro thing. I see, uh, like Natalie asked, is this different for a crop sensor? Or is it still relevant if we're thinking about things like the different sensor sizes that are available? So when we're talking about one-to-one -one as the kind of the definition of macro, does that change with sensor size and how does that work? The definition of one-to-one -one doesn't change, right? The idea of our subject in real life being projected onto the sensor the same size, that definition doesn't change. However, the size of our sensor gets smaller. So the area of that image that we're then able to see is now smaller. So we've effectively cropped in onto that one-to-one -one macro area. So if we're like, when we're trying to get extreme macro, a lot of times like a micro four thirds camera that's already got a crop, like a two X crop factor. If we were to take two pictures at a one-to-one -one macro, um, one with a full frame camera and one with a micro four thirds sensor, um, we're going to have a tighter crop. We're gonna be, it's going to feel like we are closer in, tighter in on the subject on the micro four thirds camera. So with my example here of the, my slide mount, um, so this is for a 35 millimeter sensor. A crop sensor is half of that, right? So this is 24 by 36 millimeter. A crop sensor is 
uh, 16 by 24. So at one to one, my subject, so if I go back to my little Lawa sticker here, it still is my subject. Now I'm only gonna see a smaller portion of it. But the size that it is projected onto the sensor is still going to be the same size as it, as it is in real life. Okay. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, and I get several questions like, what lens are you using? Is there any crop factor? Um, I wonder if like somebody asked for specifically for the 15 millimeter example. And I wonder if we just could quickly throw up an example of that, that wide angle macro. Yeah, I can switch over. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, if we spotlight me again. Um, so this is a series of, of, of images that I shot. So we'll start. This is uh, at a 100 millimeter. Um, and then this is the same flower. My goal is to, to get the, the pollen the, the same size. This is that same flower shot at 15 millimeter, right? And so, so the, the, the subject being the, 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 the pollen there, roughly the same size, we're getting a very different perspective on the background, right? Um, and then as an example, here's a 24 millimeter. Um, whereas a little bit didn't, didn't hold my size all the way through, but again, the 20 more millimeter, 24 millimeter, we have a little bit wider field of view. Um, if I go to the other example, that was the, the 15 mil that I just shot the other day, that was this dandelion, um, which yeah, the 15 millimeter ultra wide macro. Mm -hmm. So you can see that there's challenges, um, you know, the angle of view um, with, you know, a, a hundred millimeter, you're losing the distractions in the background pretty easily when you get close. Um, but there's super big opportunities too. Like I said, if you're photographing into, I, I was trying with a flowering tree where like you got the whole canopy of the tree behind, you know. Oh, wow. So there's different uses for different ones, I think. Yeah, yeah. For yeah, it's that lenses. the same thing that we talk about in any of our classes, where the the wide angle lenses exaggerate perspective, where the long lenses flatten out perspective, and it's seeing that exaggerated perspective where the the foreground really just jumps out at you is not something we're really used to seeing in macro work. Yes, yeah. But it's like an environmental portrait of an ant, where you get the ant and then <laughs> like everything going on around them. Yeah is really, yes. really unique. Yes. It takes some time to switch into that mindset, but you know, looking through the camera helps. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, it's so yeah. unusual. Yeah. Cool. There's a question here from Lorian Howard who says, I have a 30 millimeter macro lens for my Olympus EM5. Would I be able to use extension tubes instead of purchasing a 60 millimeter? It it wouldn't, so extension tubes, um, <laughs> yeah, so they're, 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 like, I know the answer to this, but not quite how to phrase it. Yeah, right, it's, you're extending the focal length, yes, um, so yeah, so you could add 30 millimeters of extension onto your 30 millimeter uh, lens and, and have a 60 millimeter focal length. However, the rest of the optics haven't adjusted and the focus hasn't adjusted. So you're now able to focus a whole lot closer, right? You're probably able to focus down um, with that much extension on a 30 millimeter. Um, yeah, if you were getting, so that the Olympus 30 millimeter, I think is a one-to-one -one even. Um, so if you've got the, the Olympus 30 millimeter um, at one-to-one, -one, you can probably get close to a two-to-one uh, magnification, but if you try and focus any further away than probably even two or three inches, the camera's just, just not gonna be able to do it. So that's where extension tubes work, but not, yeah, they, they, they allow you to get closer, but they, they limit your functionality in the process. Right. So, okay. um, yeah. Gotcha. And the closer you are to your subject, the harder it can be to light the actual subject. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. you can you can 
put your own shadow in there. Um, mm -hmm. I was finding that working with a 15 millimeter. Um, that I really had to have side light. If the light was behind me, <laughs> I was shadowing. Yeah, you see nothing but the shadow of the lens that you're trying to photograph with. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. That's got to be tricky. It's it's yeah. a fun challenge, though. <laughs> oh, for sure. I think whenever you're working in macro, you have to kind of dig into the challenge of it. <laughs> that makes it more fun. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I like like the discussion of you know, being on the tripod versus freehand and things and the idea of using the, you know, shoot at 30 frames per second to do your focus stack because you're going to be moving around anyway. Um, yeah. There's a lot of weird like hacks and workarounds for things. It's, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm still working on the technique. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, I'm sure it's going to take practice. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of practice and figuring out um, but that, yeah, with that OM1, I was pretty impressed with how easy it was to just do, all right, I've got every slice of this flower in, in, in a second, right? Mm -hmm. I've got a hundred frames right there. So, all right. um, uh, two quick things. First, I've got a couple of people who have asked if we're going to be doing any recording of the hands-on. The hands-on is really a, a demo day. It's a really like, we're gonna put these things in your hands so that you can go out and try them out on the flowers and bugs and stuff that exist outside in our little photo park, we call it out back, All right? So there's not really anything to record there for playback later. It's the, here, go try this out, play with it, you know, and we'll, we can like kind of work with you and help you out and help you have a good time out there and get some pictures. But there's not really a presentation portion of that to really record and play back. Right? Yeah, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to record some some quick clips of stuff for social media and, and, and oh, post yeah, for sure. quick, quick hands-on ideas. We, we, we can get the get us do a quick setup on the, the Godox MF12 lights and the Nisi rail. We, we can do a couple of quick clips. So yeah. pay attention to the Dan social media for, for that stuff. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. Uh, let's see. Jim asks, does Laua make Olympus mount lenses? Yes. Micro four thirds. Uh, we make a 50 millimeter, uh, right on me, uh, 50 millimeter two to one macro. Um, and so the ability to go to a two to one macro on a micro four thirds sensor that's going to crop in additionally 2x gives you a ton of flexibility. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that orchid that I shot on the, the OMD was on that 50 millimeter all the way down at a two to one. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm super, super tight uh, on it and just every layer, so. All right. We seem to have lost Steven's screen. Actually, Steven, can you do me a favor and just throw up that last slide that you had on your screen share? Um, or was it Cheryl that had that? I, I had it. I'll get it. All right. <laughs> Listen. That's the one. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So that's us. Uh, so that's the, do we have, first of all, I think we got all the question questions. I will be, we did record this. I will be sending out a follow-up email with all the information and links to some of the stuff that we talked about, uh, the app, all that. Um, so I'll be sending out that information and I will make sure to include a link so that you can watch the replay. I'll have that up for at least a week for you guys to be able to go back and rewatch this and get some of the information. I know there was a lot of stuff in here and it kind of went by fast. Uh, oh, that's right. There was another question about uh, what was it that you were doing to block wind when you were out there? I think that somebody wanted a little more detail on what it was like trying to block the wind. <laughs> so I'm, I'm using a reflector a lot like this guy here. Um, where so I'm, it's just a big, a big sheet that I can control and put it in the way. If I'm shooting over on the side, I will put put a reflector in front so that I'm I'm trying to give myself a little bit of a wind block as I'm shooting. So this is just a reflector. This is a pop up where it'll fold down into uh, <laughs> if you do it right. This do we not, go for that? <laughs> we all have been there. <laughs> trying to wrestle with the reflector and there something to um if you work early in the morning you, there won't be as much wind yes um, yeah and when there is wind you can usually kind of get your composition and wait there's usually a lull mm -hmm. so you can 
be yeah i found that's another case where i'll use that continuous shooting it's the same as shooting any kind of action right i'm just firing away and waiting for that one where the thing i was trying to photograph comes into where i want it to be yes (laughs) yes uh last last couple questions there on the the godox oh yeah Paul, yep. Paul's got a Paul's got a comment there on the the Nikon SBR two hundred, yeah, um, which was an amazing speed light. I don't even think Nikon is making them anymore. Um, they if they are, I'm pretty sure they're very tough to get. Uh, this to me is the replacement. Um, it's got a little bit of the same idea and the same legacy where you've got multiple small lights. Um, and you've got a, a ring mount that you can use them on, but you can also use them separately and everything works wirelessly. Whereas the, where the Nikon system, you needed, you needed that SU-800 controller and you also needed there to not be a lot of bright sun because it was, it's an optical system, right? It's using the Nikon CLS system. So mm-hmm. it's an optical slave where it needs visible light to be able to shoot. And if you're in the sun, uh, often the, the receivers can't see it. Uh, and so the Godox system is using uh, a radio slave. And so it's, it's using a, a t- full TTL communication um, and the slave to be able to fire and trigger this light and then control multiple other lights in the setup. Right. And so, that guy mounts right to the front of the camera. Yeah. This guy, you, you get a ring and it mounts right onto the front of the lens. And so then you can have multiple lights right on top of the subject. Um, where a traditional ring light, you have lights all the way around and it just presents a very flat, soft light. Um, this guy, you have more control because you can, one, you can adjust the power of light, the light coming from one side or the other and yeah. make it a little bit more dramatic. You can move more lights to one side. You can take lights off of one side and move them to the background. Um, so you've got a lot more control than just a, a normal ring light but you can you can if you want that flat look i can also put my four lights on there bring them all bent in and have just a very very flat light coming from all around my subject yeah so yeah it's a it's a very cool gadget i was thrilled when they came out with that thing because specifically because i don't think nikon was making the um the r800 r200 whatever it was yeah the r200 is the lights and the su800 is the trigger yeah yeah, and it's a yeah. sort of the next generation of that, and it was really cool to see him come out with that. Yeah. Uh, All right. We have so yeah. we got that one. Cool. I believe we've got uh, Sherry asks, "What does Cheryl use for lighting?" Um, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually outside, not. I'm not using light, but I did show. Um, instances where I was using off-camera flash and I have an Mm SB700 that I trigger. Um, Either there's been times I've actually used a a cord Mm -hmm. (laughs) or I can um, trigger it with my onboard flash or um, or a remote um, Mm -hmm. trigger um, when I'm using a flash. But I don't, I don't do that too much. That's usually for me trying to prove some kind of point in my mind um, or try something different. Mm-hmm. Um, oftentimes when I'm, whenever I'm doing a white background, I'll either have a, a soft box or um, a light pad. Okay. Um, I haven't, I don't have um, a great reliable one light pad that I always go to, but that is, um, Gotcha. It's definitely often if I'm putting a um, composition together where I want to be focused or I want to be shooting downward, um, it will be on a light pad. Okay, but, and then you're using it that's supporting the subject and shooting kind of back upward. Yeah. So if I would have the light pad like as a floor and then I'd arrange on it and I'd shoot on a tripod down. Okay. So um, it's effectively but, backlit, right? Yes. Yeah, it's definitely uh, backlit. But that's that's how I go about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also take that same light pad and I will put it up like on the wall, you know, and use it as a background. Alternatively, you can use, um, you know, any 
light in a soft box would mm-hmm. work for that as well. One thing you have to uh, be aware of in that is if your light is too powerful or to your subjects too close to your light, you can lose the edges. Um, oh, the light right. Will yeah, you're going to get that spill around the edge. Yeah. The light yeah. pad is generally um, low enough power that you don't have to worry about that. But if you're using um, some sort of strobe in a softbox, that could right. be more of a 800 <laughs> watt second of an studio issue. strobe is going to, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that about does it. I think we've gotten all through all of the questions. So Thank thanks you, so much for joining us this afternoon. Yeah. This has been great. Uh, I hope you're able to join us. At least some of you are able to join us out in the photo park at Dan's Camera City in Allentown on Saturday. Uh, it's going to be a good time. The weather looks good. We'll have a bunch of these toys out there for you to play with. As I said, I'm going to send a follow-up email out with links to the information on the event, with uh, the link to watch this recording. Um, some of the apps and stuff that we talked about. And of course, a link to all the Laowa lenses that have sales going on right now. Uh, Stephen was wonderfully able to extend the existing sales and instant rebates out through the 23rd. So uh, you've got one last chance to snag some deals on these lenses. Um, as I said, if you've got any questions, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, follow us on the, you know, do the, the Instagrams and the Facebooks. We've got a little community group where we all share pictures with each other and I'll send a link to that as well. Right. So once again, awesome. thank you guys from Stephen and Cheryl from Laua. Uh, this has been great. Yes. Thank that, you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. This is, this is great. And, and yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, seeing, seeing some people on Saturday. All right, well, Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, Until next time, again, I'm Scott from Dan's Camera City. I hope to see you again at one of our webinars or outings or workshops or something uh, at some point in the future. We actually have another webinar going on tomorrow. So check our Facebook or Eventbrite or all of the things and uh, join us again. We'll see you later. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you again soon.